Well, another week goes by and we find ourselves once again doing the History of the Restoration Movement slideshow archives. This is module number 14, and in this module we will be discussing the philosophical ideas that undergird the first generation of the Restoration Movement. Particularly, we're going to look at two main ideas. One is known as Scottish Common Sense rationalism. And in general it's called Scottish common sense rationalism because A, it's from Scotland, B, it relies on a notion of common sense. But it's also a rationalism. It is a way of thinking. And as we're going to discover, it is not necessarily uh, something you can take for granted that when someone is using common sense that they are actually on the same page and that is particularly true when it comes to reading and understanding um, a author's point of view and this would become fundamentally important when it comes to interpreting the Bible and understanding the point of view of a biblical author. And all of this is to say that the Scottish common sense philosophy will strongly influence Alexander and Thomas Campbell, and through them will exert an influence on many of the other first generation uh, founders of the Restoration Movement. So I'd like to begin by noting two, uh, we'll call them uh, philosophers of our day and age. This is of course, the popular memes, Velociraptor and Grumpy Cat. <clears throat> and both of these memes uh, express the same common idea, and that is that what we would call common sense is in fact something rather rare. Velociraptor puts it much more nicely when he says, why do we call it common sense when it's not so common? Grumpy Cat, being his uh, usual um, uh, hate, hatred towards humanity self, phrases it more uh, negatively by simply asking why the problem with common sense is that most people are morons, that they don't possess common sense. And so, if we're going to discuss a philosophy based on common sense, we, we, we really need to start to define, well, what is common sense? And I think more appropriately when we talk about common sense, we often talk about things that we can take for granted. What are things in this world that we can take for granted? And while we could probably pick hundreds of these things, I'd like to take a question from the realm of astronomy because it will really help to illustrate this point by looking at how things that are observable in astronomy, often things that are taken as common sense today, were in fact uh, the product of quite a lot of research, observation, and just in general high-powered philosophical activity that brought us to the understanding that we are today. And so, let me phrase it this way. In astronomy, the blank revolves around the blank. And in general, we could have three answers to this. One, the Earth revolves around the Sun is probably the most common answer. <coughs> A second answer is the moon revolves around the earth or if you are particularly adept at other uh, astronomical ideas that the moons of other planets revolve around their planet and then the third possibility is that the earth revolves around its axis any of those three would be a fair enough assessment, but I'd like to point out what all three of those have in common, is that every one of these ideas focuses on what is known as a heliocentric 
universe. But we'll discuss that more here in a second. Because first we need to talk about a revolution. Actually, we need to talk about two revolutions. And I would like to suggest that in the 1500s, two revolutions of ideas got underway. And once these ideas got rolling, it changed the landscape of the Western world as we know it. And specifically, what changed about these ideas was that we started questioning epistemology. Now, that's a pretty advanced uh, term here, so let's define it. Uh, pistis is a Greek word meaning truth. And so, epistemology is the study of truth, and specifically, how do we get truth? What are our criteria for dubbing something as true? <clears throat> now, the biggest shock to this Western epistemology came from Martin Luther in the early 1500s. And specifically, what Martin Luther will do is he will challenge age-old doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church. And specifically, Luther will show that these doctrines of the Catholic Church are neither infallible, meaning that they could be wrong, and also that they are not impregnable, meaning that they can be changed, that somebody can alter them over time, or that they can be altered abruptly even. And this will be important because even things like Martin Luther's three main dictums, uh, that a person is saved sola gratia, by grace alone, sola fide, by their faith alone, and sola scriptura, by what they read in the scripture alone, that when Luther expressed these ideas, that they were revolutionary ideas, that no one had quite put the plan of salvation this way before. Now, again, I'm not s trying to suggest that these ideas are not found in Scripture, because I think you can make a very strong argument that they are. What I am saying is that no one had expressed it in these terms. And this will revolutionize the way that we think about the church and think about salvation in particular. And it's noticeable that when you start rethinking what does it mean to be saved? What does it mean to have a relationship with God? Noting that that radically changed in the 1500s from the age-old Catholicism. And what this will do, ultimately, is it will introduce doubt into the equation. All of a sudden, the Catholic Church will be shown to be a institution that we can't quite trust anymore like we used to. But I'd also like to suggest that a second theological revolution was happening at almost exactly the same time as Luther's revolution. Now, it will take a little bit longer for this one to come to full flower, as it were, because Nicholas Copernicus will not publish his findings until close to his deathbed. And even then, it will take quite some time for his ideas to catch on. But what happened with Copernicus is that he will challenge another doctrine, whereas Luther challenged the doctrine of soteriology, or salvation. And Copernicus will challenge ideas of cosmology, how the universe is shaped, how it works, and specifically that he will question the idea of what is known as the geocentric universe, or the earth-centered universe. Now, because the ideas of a geocentric or an earth-centered universe probably would strike most of you as bizarre, let's come to 
terms with where this idea came from. Simply put, this is often known as the Ptolemaic system, a Greek philosopher named Ptolemy, living in Egypt around the 2nd century AD, <coughs> will write what is often referred to as the definitive treatise on the earth as the center of the universe. And he will suggest that the major bodies that revolve around the earth are the planets. In this case, the moon, Mercury, Venus, and his model, the sun, is then third in line, followed by Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. And then each one of these is in a successively more distant ring. And so, as we see on this picture here, we've got the moon in the first ring, we've got Mercury in the, th the second, Venus in the third, Sun in the fourth, Mars in the fifth, Jupiter in the sixth, Saturn in the seventh. <coughs> and then, in the eighth ring, or sphere, we see the stars. All of them just in what is known as a fixed position. And this is Ptolemy's masterwork, as it were. And what is notable about this is that Ptolemy's worldview of the earth being at the center will be translated into Latin very early on, and it will become kind of the premier science textbook for everyone in the Middle Ages. If you want to understand astronomy, you start by reading Ptolemy, and you go from there. And what that will do, all the way up through the time of Copernicus, is it will set the tone that when you want to talk about the Earth and where everything else is in the universe in position to it, you talk about the Earth as being the center of things. Now, what Copernicus will suggest in the 1540s is what is known as the heliocentric universe. Now, the heliocentric universe is, as we have pictured here to the right, the sun is in the center of the solar system, and all of the various uh, bodies, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and sometimes Pluto, all revolve around the sun. That is heliocentrism, after the uh, Roman god, or sorry, the Greek god Helios, the sun. Um, but notice there, there's also a very fundamental aspect about this that needs to be pointed out. In a geocentric universe, you have a very man-oriented understanding, i.e., it is very easy to assert in a geocentric universe that God created man to be the center of everything. Because everything revolves around Earth, the place where man dwells. Notice in a heliocentric universe, though, Earth becomes a very small, tiny, and almost insignificant little speck going around a very large nuclear furnace. And many will suggest, even early on, that heliocentrism detracts from the biblical view that mankind is made as a unique being. Now, something else interesting is going to happen because of this, and this will be namely that the because the Ptolemaic geocentric system is so prevalent that many will take what they know about the Bible and we'll run it through this geocentric filter and come up with some very interesting results. Here will be one of those interesting results. Near the end of Martin Luther's life, he will read Copernicus's work, and he will absolutely hate it. <clears throat> and he'll specifically, when he's talking with his friends, go on record and say this about Copernicus, quote, Copernicus is a new astrologer who wants to prove that the Earth moves and goes around. The fool wants to turn the whole art of astronomy upside down. As Holy Scripture tells us, 
So did Joshua bid the sun to stand still, and not the earth. <clears throat> Basically, Martin Luther has done a very interesting little proof text here. He says, Copernicus's system means that the earth has to revolve around the sun. But we know that this is just idiotic because scripture says when Joshua prayed, he prayed to God for the sun to stand still, not for the earth to stand still. And so Martin Luther, using Sola Scriptura, basically proof texts the Ptolemaic universe. And he does so by assuming that the worldview of Joshua is the same as his and also corresponds with reality and specifically with a objective reality as opposed to a positional reality. And what I mean by positional is this. Anyone who does not have access to telescopes, as people like Galileo did, and who do not have access to advanced mathematics, as Copernicus did, and who have not left this planet, as have many astronauts, <clears throat> are really stuck with a positional understanding of reality. We wake up in the morning, we go outside, we look, and the sun rises in the east. Throughout the course of the day, we'll move across the sky and then set in the west. From a positional point of view, it makes sense to say the sun moves. And it also makes sense for the biblical authors to describe it as such. It even makes sense for Luther to defend such an idea. However, as time and experience have proven, Copernicus was right. And so, did that suddenly nullify the scripture? Not necessarily. Joshua could have indeed prayed for the sun to stand still, and God, honoring that request, causes the sun to appear not to move in the sky. It's a fair enough uh, assessment. But you notice Martin Luther is taking the Ptolemaic worldview and assuming it is the worldview of the Bible. Now, Martin Luther's colleague and younger protege will be even more emphatic against it in his book, Elements of Physics. Um, Philip Melanchthon will write this. The eyes are witness that the heavens revolve around uh, revolve in a space of 24 hours. But certain men, either from a love of novelty or to make a display of ingenuity, have concluded that the earth moves. <coughs> Excuse me. And they maintain that neither the eighth sphere of the fixed stars nor the sun revolves. It is a lack of honesty and decency to assert such notions publicly. And the example is pernicious. It is the part of a good mind to accept truth as revealed by God and to acquiesce to it. Notice that Melanchthon begins to use quite a lot of derogatory terms here. Um, that he specifically suggests that it is simply a matter of looking up to know that the sun moves, that the fixed stars move, that a day is 24 hours, and that um, anyone who would suggest otherwise is simply just dishonest and lacking good quality decency. Now, on this side of the equation, some 450 years later, it's very easy to look at Philip Melanchthon and say, what an idiot. Come on, man. What is wrong with you? But you see, this is the power of an idea. If you've been trained at a university that the sun moves around the earth, and that is part of your university training, that one of the things you study is astronomy, 
you read Ptolemy, and you understand that the Earth is the center of the universe. All of a sudden, everything that you see, everything that you read, falls into that small little framework. And I would like to suggest that we do this often with Scripture all the time. And we'll come up with a word for this here in a second. But Philip Melanchthon here, like Martin Luther, basically said, if you reject the geocentric universe, you are basically refusing to accept truth as God has revealed it. And you are refusing to submit to God's truth. Now, another trend that we will see in these early reformers is that they will frequently cite Psalm 104, verse 5, which reads, He, meaning God, has established the earth upon its foundations, so that it will not be moved forever and ever. Again, the Hebrew word is uh, olam, which is frequently a term that means for eternity, or for a very, very long time. <clears throat> and here was... Uh, Calvin's commentary on the Psalms. Here's how Calvin uh, interprets this passage. Quote, Here the prophet celebrates the glory of God as manifested in the stability of the earth, since it is suspended in the midst of the air and is supported only by pillars of water. How does it keep its place so steadfastly so that it cannot be moved? This I indeed grant may be explained by natural, meaning observable, principles. For the earth, as it is, occupies the lowest place, being the center of the cosmos, naturally settles down there. You notice here that Calvin, like the other reformers, Martin Luther and uh, Philip Melanchthon, all of them assume that the earth is the center of the world and that it does not move. And if you dare question that, then you it is tantamount to questioning Psalm 104 verse 5 that are you saying that the earth which was established on its foundations can move? Are you saying that that which God declared will not be moved forever and ever amen moves? Well, Philip, or sorry, um, uh, the that's basically what Copernicus does. Copernicus sets up a counter idea, and I find it interesting that the Roman Catholic Church does not immediately respond to his ideas. It actually will not be for about another fifty years later when a man named Galileo will invent the telescope and. Looking through his telescope, he will set his eyes on Jupiter, and he'll find something very interesting. He'll notice that there's small little moons going around the planet Jupiter. And all of a sudden, it will become quite, uh, quite obvious to Galileo, Copernicus may be right. Because here is something not revolving around the Earth, but revolving around Jupiter. Which means that if other things can have a center other than Earth, well, why not see about other things? And it's at this point that the Catholic Church will begin coming down hard on this idea, just like the Reformers did. But it is interesting to note that the Reformers, these people who spend quite a deal of their time saying the Roman Catholic Church could be wrong. When it comes to Copernicus's ideas, they're going to say, but we couldn't have been wrong about that. And I'd like to suggest that this will be a pattern when it comes to Christian exegesis of the Bible or interpretation of the Bible. When it comes into direct contact with the natural sciences. Because as the knowledge of the universe expands there will be this very pressing problem of how do we make the biblical text match or somehow coincide with what we assume about science.
This method of interpreting the Bible this way is known as concordism. And for a definition we'll use in class, we'll call concordism this. Concordism is when you read the Bible and assume that the worldview of the author, particularly in the realms of science and philosophy, are the same as the reader in the modern day. Now, notice this diagram that I have here. And I hate to say it, but the more I look at this diagram, the more I really, really like it. But <clears throat> basically, in this diagram, we have two sources of information about the world. Both of them come from God. One is Scripture. The other is nature. And notice that both of these items, Scripture must go through a human brain and interpret it, and thus we get what we call theology. And likewise, nature goes through an observer, someone to process this, some, someone to analyze this, and eventually creates what we would call science, or something whose main goal is to understand physical reality, whereas theology's main goal is to understand a spiritual reality. Now notice, in both of these cases, we have human interpretation as the wild card. It has to go through that mushy gray matter that resides in everybody's skull. And there's no guarantee that, even though the same data goes in one way, that it will come out as good science or good theology once it's been interpreted. And, just again, no, in this diagram, they both require interpretation. Now, after Luther and Copernicus, it will become very difficult to assert, to, ask, to assert that either science or theology is a fixed, unchanging proposition. And by this I mean that Luther and Copernicus, in the 1500s, will introduce a a possibility of error that human interpreting scripture could have been wrong and human interpretations of nature could have been wrong and once you open that possibility that they've been wrong once might they get proven wrong again now before we shift gears here I would just like to say that concordism will be one of the major banes of the Restoration Movement. Because the Restoration Movement will frequently appeal to Scripture, and that they will attempt to interpret Scripture based on plain meanings. They will, uh, For example, Alexander Campbell once noted that he reads his Bible like I read the newspaper. I simply open it up and see what it says. Now, the problem is, when you read a newspaper, it is safe to assume that your worldview and the worldview of the newspaper writer are fairly close together. After all, you probably come from the same country, if not the same city or even state. Uh, you're probably at least speaking the same language. And while you may not take everything for granted the same, that there's a lot less distance between you and a newspaper author than a modern reader and the Bible. And this is where the problem comes in. The Bible, for better or for worse, is written from an ancient point of view. And this is why when a person engages in biblical studies, they spend so much of their time asking questions of the author and the audience. Specifically, that they'll be asking questions like, well, who was the author? What was his worldview like? Who was the audience of this text? What do they take for granted? What do they understand about reality? And in general, this must always be kept in mind when interpreting the Bible, that both in terms of cosmology, meaning the way the world and the universe 
works and is organized, and in terms of society in general, the Bible expresses an ancient worldview, and not necessarily a modern worldview. And while I could go on all day, I'd just like to kind of direct you to a man named John Walton. He's a Old Testament professor at Wheaton. And Walton makes a very keen observation in his book, The Lost World of Genesis 1, where he writes, The Bible was not written to us. It was written to them. It is still important for us today, but it is our responsibility to cross the gap to them, not the other way around. And I think that this is a very good admonition, and it's one that has not been employed in the Restoration Movement all that often, much to uh, my chagrin, at least. But it's true. The Bible is not necessarily written to me, Corey Allen, or to you, the class of uh, the Restoration Movement, 2013. The Bible was written to an ancient audience. And if we want to read Scripture appropriately, it is up to us to cross that gap, that time gap, the language gap, the culture gap. And to do that requires a methodology. It requires a certain amount of give and take. And it requires, when you read the text, to understand that the worldview being suggested by the Bible may not necessarily match my worldview. That is the problem of concordism. So, aiming to cross the bridge from the early reformers and Martin Luther to about 200 years later when we start to get to the dawn of the Restoration Movement, <clears throat> I'd like to suggest that one of the things that Martin Luther and Copernicus changed is that they instituted a new way of thinking that once that door had been opened, it was almost impossible to go back. Now, there's an old saying that said that the scholar Erasmus laid the egg which Luther hatched. And by this they meant that Erasmus did all the legwork so that Martin Luther could jump on the bandwagon and run with it. That Erasmus had compiled a critical edition of the New Testament. He had made it kind of a go in life to see the revitalization of Greek, Hebrew, and other ancient forms of learning and to have those things come back into the university setting. Basically, Erasmus made a very, very lovely fountain for Luther to drink from. And as such, Luther took those ideas and ran with them to very logical conclusions. But I would like to suggest that Martin Luther also laid a rather revolutionary egg, and it took a little while for it to hatch. But that egg is this. He introduced suspicion. Specifically, he introduced what I'll call the hermeneutic of suspicion, that when we start to interpret scripture, when we start to interpret uh, findings from science, when we start to interpret basically anything that comes in through our minds, we start to ask the question, are we wrong? You know, before, there was a lot of things we took for granted during the Middle Ages or the Dark Ages, if you will. And all of a sudden, people like Luther and Copernicus proved that we could be wrong. And from that moment on, mankind, at least in the West, was suspicious of knowledge. That all of a sudden, we have to periodically rethink what we think we know from the bottom up. Otherwise, well, we may end up making the same mistake again. Now, traditionally, when we go back to Erasmus and we think of this idea of the egg that Erasmus laid, the name that they often give to that egg is called humanism. Well, the egg that Martin Luther laid, I would like to suggest, also has a philosophical name. 
skepticism. And many philosophers that lived after the time of Martin Luther will begin to play with this hermeneutic of suspicion. And they will basically assert that most things in life should be questioned. And some will even go so far as to say that even our senses, sight, smell, taste, touch, even these things should be questioned. Can they really give us real data? Good data? <clears throat> and while many examples could probably be mustered here, let's start with a, a French philosopher named René Descartes. That Descartes will use what is known as the uh, epistemological claim of cogito ergo sum, uh, translated into English meaning, I think, therefore I am, or therefore I exist. And he only arrived at this by employing this idea of skepticism, or a hermeneutic of extreme doubt. And he, he got there by using two conjectures. The first conjecture was the dream conjecture, and it goes like this. No matter what I think, no matter what I see, no matter what I feel, there's a possibility I could be dreaming, and none of this is real. The second conjecture is what he calls the demon conjecture, and it goes like this. For all I know, at every moment of the day, there is a demon running around. And his job is to make sure that everything I see, everything I feel, everything I touch, everything that goes on in my life, this demon makes sure that I don't see, feel, touch, whatever, that I can't do it correctly. That this demon makes it his job to deceive me and my senses. Now, if you think these two ideas are pretty far-fetched and ridiculous, good, you're in very good company. Um, quoting Moore and Bruder in their uh, introduction to philosophy, quote, yes, these two conjectures are totally bizarre. And Descartes was as well aware of it as you are. But that's just the point. Descartes was looking for a measure of certainty that escapes the most incredible and even bizarre pr probabilities of falsehood. And so why does the cogito argument work? Because even if the demon is trying to trick me, I can still say I'm thinking. I may be thinking erroneously, but at least I know I'm thinking. And the same thing with the dream conjecture. Yeah, I may be dreaming all the time, but you know what? By dreaming, I'm at least thinking. And so Rene Descartes' entire premise of proving that the self, or at least the mind, exist, is that if it thinks, it must therefore exist. Now, we should probably ask the question, so why are we asking this extreme skepticism? Why are we even saying, you know, I can't even trust my own eyes and my own ears? Well, simply put, for centuries, humans had been relying on the Bible and very ancient philosophical texts to make sense of the world. After Luther and Copernicus, we have doubt. And once you open that gate that maybe something could be wrong, you have to really re-examine everything from the ground up. And that includes even our five senses. Basic facts of life start to be questioned once again. And by the late 1600s, early 1700s, this skepticism will begin even kind of flirting with the idea of, well, how do we know that God exists? How do we know that these scriptures are God-breathed? You know, very basic questions of epistemology that Martin Luther took for granted all of a sudden will become a center stage in the question. And one of the first and major atheists that will come out of this movement will be a man named David Hume. Now, Hume is going to take this skepticism and he's going to run with it to very, very extreme conclusions. For example, he's going to say that, yeah, Descartes is right. You can prove a human's consciousness. But you know what? Apart from that, you can't prove it. You can't prove anything else.
And he's also going to say the existence of other individuals cannot be proven. I can prove that I think, but I can't prove that you think. I can't get into your mind. I can't see things from your way. I can't prove that your color blue is my color blue. And on and on it goes. And likewise, Hume will conclude, likewise, I cannot prove that God exists either. And this will be kind of the building block foundations for what will ultimately be called atheism. Now, I'd also like to point out, though, that Hume is a very extreme example of this kind of skepticism that others will not go nearly as far, and some will even produce very sound philosophical ideas that we will use to this very day. And probably the biggest name in that is an uh, Englishman named Sir Francis Bacon. And Bacon will establish a system of certainty that we call empiricism. Now, you probably know it by a different name when you studied it in middle school and high school, and that is the scientific method. Empiricism works by drawing conclusions based on observation and evidence. And the basic method goes like this. First you observe something. Then you make a thesis to basically explain why this observation happened. Next you test your thesis to see whether it holds up to see whether it is consistent. If it does continue to be consistent, it goes into uh, a hypothesis or it goes into a, uh, a theory. And eventually, if you test it long enough, it can become a law, i.e. something you can take for granted. Things like gravity uh, tend to fall into that law category because we tested the attraction of mass so frequently that we understand that mass will attract other mass and the most massive object will attract the most things to it. Hence why every time I jump, I keep falling back to the earth because the earth being the most massive object around keeps pulling me down. So that's the notion of empiricism. Obviously, empiricism will become extremely popular, so much so that we kind of take it for granted that this is how we get knowledge. And I would also like to point out that people like Alexander Campbell of the Restoration Movement will attempt to say that their reading of the Bible is a scientific reading. Now, I do think you can read the Bible uh, in very uh, informed ways, that you can take hermeneutical approaches to it. But it is somewhat of a falsehood to say that you read the Bible scientifically. The empirical method does not really work when it goes to dealing with biblical text 100% of the time. And so, just keep in mind that while empiricism will become very popular, it will become the foundation for what we call science today, that many of the Restoration Movement founders will claim to be reading their Bible scientifically. And we'll discuss that more when we start to see it in later, um, in later lectures. But just kind of keep that on the back burner for now. Now, another Englishman... Uh, approximately a century later will take uh, Francis Bacon's ideas and he will run with them to some pretty interesting conclusions. Uh, this man's name is John Locke and John Locke will profoundly influence both the American Revolution and many of the restorationists of the Stone Campbell movement, specifically Alexander Campbell. Now, Locke will take empiricism and he will follow those dictates as far as he can and he will write several very profound letters. The first one that he's known for is what, what is known as the letter concerning toleration. Now again, 
we often in our society take religious toleration for granted. We have the First Amendment, and we've lived for about 200 years with the understanding that no one can just up and kill me, or you for that matter, uh, in this society for religious reasons. That we have this idea of toleration of other religious ideas. But when Locke first expresses this, this is going to be a rather radical idea. But Locke will be one of the first people to articulate that there should be room for private opinions where scriptures are silent. If the scripture doesn't deal with the topic, there should be room for people to say this or that or the other. And this is going to become a key benchmark of the Restoration Movement. They, that they will often refer to this idea, where the scriptures are silent, we are silent. Now, that can be taken two ways, and we'll discuss that later, but for now, just kind of keep in mind that if the scriptures are silent, what does it mean to be silent? Does it mean that I can hold a private opinion? Or does that mean I should hold no opinion? Again, that will become more clear as time goes on. But additionally, Locke will be one of the first people to articulate the idea that if a doctrine is not necessary for salvation, you cannot make it a test of fellowship or, a, or something that is required to have Christian communion. And this will also profoundly influence the rest, Restoration Movement because if an idea is not necessary for salvation, then why are we judging other people by it? And this will become quite profound in that the Restoration Movement will have a very Jesus-oriented soteriology. What does it take for someone to be baptized in a uh, Christian church, uh, Church of Christ organiz or organization? Simply the profession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And in some cases, also asserting, and I submit to his lordship. That's really it. That will become the major term of communion for the Restoration Movement. And it's all based on this idea of Locke, that if it's not necessary for salvation, it cannot be made a test of fellowship. Now, Locke is also going to compose another major uh, treatise or essay, and this one is called The Essay Concerning Human Understanding. And several things that Locke will assert in this one. One, he will assert that human beings begin life as what is known as a tabla rosa, or a blank slate. And basically, he's going to say that everything that a human being learns comes about by experience. A newborn human being has absolutely nothing imprinted on their mind. And they have to be taught everything, including how to respect God, including how to worship, including how to love, including how to hate. And basically, this idea of Tabla Rosa will basically say that all human knowledge, everything human beings think they know, claim to know, or actually do know, comes about through one of two means. Either A, a human experiences it, sees it, smells it, touches it, whatever, or a human uses their power of intellect and reflects upon it. For example, I don't have to know that I will probably die if I jump out of an airplane without a parachute. I don't have to experience that. I can use human reflection the fact that other people have died doing similar things, and come to a conclusion that I don't want to jump out of an airplane. But again, all based on this idea that human knowledge comes through either experience or reflection. And this will, this will uh, strongly influence one of his conjectures, which is that a feeling or a mystical source, i.e. that somebody has like a religious experience, is not necessarily a valid source for Christian knowledge. 
Now, Alexander Campbell and Thomas Campbell will really, really latch on to this idea. But I'd like to point out that this will go very counterintuitive to what we saw happening in the revivals earlier in the semester. That the revivals are based almost entirely on feeling and mystical sources of knowledge, mystical sources of salvation experience. Locke is going to undercut all of this by basically saying that a mystical source is not an acceptable or valid source of Christian knowledge. It may help you in your personal walk, this way or that, but you can't hold anyone to that. Now, he's also going to make another conjecture that I find somewhat difficult to defend, but he will basically say, all knowledge of God must also therefore come through revelation. But herein lies the catch-22. If we've already ruled out mystical sources, how is God to reveal himself? Because the pattern, biblically speaking, is that God would reveal himself to a author, as uh, Peter says in, in the uh, Petrine epistles. He says that um, the prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And this makes a very interesting dilemma because Locke says that God, knowledge of God must come through revelation. But most of those revelations, at least as they are understood and recorded in the Bible, come through what could be called a mystical experience. That God imparts knowledge of himself, knowledge of the world, knowledge of how things work, directly to a individual. We call this the doctrine of inspiration. And so I'd just like to point out that if Locke is correct here, then he is ultimately limiting our knowledge of God to natural revelation and not necessarily to scriptural revelation. Although Locke will not make that connection and neither will Alexander Campbell. Many later people in the restoration movement as liberalism will start to move in to uh, specifically the Disciples of Christ movement that they will begin to question even scripture as a valid source of knowledge of God. Now Particularly pertinent to our study is a school of thought that will develop in Scotland. And this school of thought is known as common sense rationalism, or often known as Scottish common sense rationalism. And one of the major proponents of this is a man named Thomas Reed. He's going to write a book called The Inquiry into the Human Mind and the Principles of Common Sense. And it will be specifically written to oppose the ideas of David Hume. Now, Thomas Reed will uh, basically make several suggestions that are meant to undercut uh, David Hume's advanced skepticism. And he's going to say, it's all based on common sense. For example, he would say, common sense tells us that things exist outside of our perceptions meaning that I know somebody else exists. I can see them, I can feel them, I can touch them, and common sense lets me know that they exist. He'll further go out to say, common sense tells me I exist. I don't have to go through the cogito argument to know that I exist. I do exist. I'm talking, I'm thinking, I'm feeling, I live, I exist. Of course, no one has to tell me this. And then he'll then draw a idea of causation and say, common sense tells me that anything that exists also needs a first cause. And therefore I can prove that God exists. This is often what is called the cosmological argument for the existence of God. That because things exist, 
they must have a creator. And that cr first cause must therefore be God. And Thomas Reed is going to further go on to say, and I can read and understand the Bible because of common sense. In fact, everyone should be able to read and understand the Bible according to the laws of common sense. And while this can be a very good um, retort to uh, people like David Hume, at the end of the day, common sense only goes so far, and we'll look at that here in a moment. But the reason why the study of people like Thomas Reed is important to the study of the Restoration Movement is Thomas Reed is living and writing in Scotland around the same time that Thomas and Alexander Campbell are studying in Scotland. That this will be kind of just a part of the air they're breathing. And it will be a basic interpretive or hermeneutical position of the Restoration Movement that you can read the Bible using common sense. And as we pointed out earlier, Alexander Campbell himself will say that he reads his Bible like he reads the newspaper. That it all, all it requires is common sense to read and understand this document. So we've come full circle, and having come full circle, we need to put up another meme. And yes, the problem with common sense is that most people don't have it. And I'd like to suggest that the founders of the Restoration Movement, and particularly Alexander and Thomas Campbell, they will take this common sense hermeneutic for granted. And as a result, their writings will be very educated. But they will also assume that a person can simply read the Bible and come to the exact same conclusion as they did. Now, unfortunately, this will really open itself up to what is called an ad hominem rhetoric, or a a type of rhetoric you use when you are trying to insult someone to make a point. You see, if reading the Bible is a matter of common sense, if someone reads the Bible and comes up to a different understanding than me, then what does that mean? It means that they must lack common sense. Because I'm certainly reading my Bible with common sense, and therefore if they come to a different conclusion, obviously common sense must be lacking in them. Now, of course, we know that this isn't true. We know that many very intelligent people read the Bible all the time and come to different conclusions. And this hermeneutic uh, will crumble into numerous, numerous petty divisions, though. That for the first hundred years of the movement, many of the reformers and restorationists will read the Bible for themselves. And they will come to an impasse when they realize they can't agree that one of them has to be wrong and that the other must seriously be lacking common sense. And this will be kind of what we start to see here somewhere around the 1830s all the way up through the early uh, 1900s, we're going to see time and time again people of the Restoration Movement getting into pretty petty and often victrolic uh, bickering matches. And it will almost always be due to this understanding that if I can read the Bible with common sense and you come to a different conclusion, one of us is stupid. And I would like to suggest that while the common sense rationalism is very helpful in opposing someone who has extreme forms of skepticism, it cannot be applied to the Bible in a laissez-faire way. That the Bible must still be interpreted, it must still be translated, and it must go through that gray matter of the human mind. And that whole process does not necessarily mean that common sense is the best way to interpret.
Because the problem with common sense is most people are morons.